One man's trash is another man's evidence. This is Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi. I'm Tony Bruschi. We're diving into some of the most jaw-dropping developments out of the Delphi murder trial. Developments that may redefine what we think we know about this case. The story we're about to tell comes directly from reporting by Bob Mata of the Defense Diaries podcast, a man who's been in the trenches following this story step by step from the courtroom. The past few days have been nothing short of grueling. Court didn't let out until 6.30 p.m., and what we witnessed was the systematic unraveling of Richard Allen's life laid bare through back-to-back interrogation videos. You think you've seen it all until you sit in that courtroom and watch how a suspect like Allen holds up under relentless questioning, maintaining a cool, unwavering demeanor while the detectives circle like sharks ready to pounce. But is that the behavior of an innocent man or the calm facade of someone with nothing left to lose? That's the psychological dance at the heart of this story. And when it comes to high-profile cases, we're used to seeing black and white narratives, the guilty and the innocent, the villain and the hero. But the recent developments in the Delphi murders trial are anything but simple. As the state wraps up its case in chief, the lines between guilt, manipulation, and systemic failure blur more than ever. Today, we're talking about two pivotal interviews conducted with Richard Allen, the man at the center of it all. These are no ordinary interviews. They are the heart of the prosecution's argument, and they might also be its Achilles heel. The first interrogation conducted on October 13, 2022, was a seemingly routine questioning by officers Mullen and Liggett. Allen was not under arrest. He was reminded that he was free to leave at any time, and his Miranda rights were read in full. On the surface, it all seemed by the book, but what unfolded was anything but ordinary. Allen's demeanor during the first interrogation. Calm. Too calm, perhaps, for a man accused of one of the most horrifying crimes in recent memory. He sits there, collected, as officers dig into the timeline of his day on February 13, 2017, the day Abigail Williams and Liberty German were brutally murdered on the Monon High Bridge Trail. Allen's story starts predictably. He spent the morning at his mother's house in Mexico, Indiana. His mother had just undergone hip surgery and Alan wanted to check on her. He recalls leaving sometime around 11.15 or 11.30 a.m. From there, things get murky. He explains that after leaving his mother's house, he went home intending to relax and watch the stock market. It's just a hobby of mine, he tells the officers in what sounds like an offhand remark. But then, in a twist that seems almost too convenient... Allen says he decided to go for a walk along the trails near the Monon High Bridge. He claims he left his house around noon, walked along the bridge to the first platform, and looked at the fish in the river below, a memory that sticks with him. Oddly specific and yet strangely mundane. When the officers press Allen on where he parked, the story takes another turn. He struggles to pinpoint the exact lot, mentioning a small gravel area that used to exist near the trailhead, possibly the old CPS building site. The officers prod him, asking if he parked at the Freedom Bridge lot, the larger parking area used by most visitors. Allen insists that he used to park in an area closer to the trail, but admits that over time, the topography had changed, and it was hard to say for certain. This is where things start to feel off-kilter. Allen's recollection is both precise and vague, he remembers specific fish, but can't recall where he parked. He remembers wearing a black Carhartt jacket, but stumbles when officers ask about the route he took to get to the bridge. It's not just what he says, it's what he leaves out that makes the officers press harder. Why did Allen fail to mention seeing Betsy Blair, the witness who claims she saw a man fitting his description on the bridge that same day? He recalls seeing three girls, not four, which raises another question— is his memory faulty or is he intentionally holding back? The second interrogation on October 26th brings even more questions. This time, the officers take a different approach. Enter Holman, a seasoned investigator armed with a forensic firearms report. Holman applies the Reed technique, a controversial method of interrogation known for pushing suspects into confessions. It's a mental chess game and Holman plays it masterfully. 
He tells Allen that a bullet found near the crime scene matches Allen's gun. The implication is clear. They have him. But instead of folding, Allen doubles down, denying that he ever loaned his gun to anyone. I've got nothing to hide, he says, his voice steady. I'm not going to be the fall guy for this. And Holman continues insinuating that the bullet might have fallen from Allen's pocket or been dropped accidentally. This is the moment where many suspects cave, scrambling for an excuse that might mitigate their guilt. But Allen doesn't bite. He stays composed even as Holman suggests leniency, an offer that's not legally binding but effective in psychological warfare. Help me help you, Holman says with the kind of friendly menace that only seasoned interrogators can pull off. But Allen stands firm, repeating, I didn't do it. The interviews reveal a chilling aspect of Allen's character. Is he a man wrongfully accused, clinging to his innocence under enormous pressure, or is he a skilled manipulator, weaving a web of half-truths to evade justice? The officers seem to believe the latter. They press on, trying to wear him down, suggesting that perhaps it wasn't him but someone he knew, someone he lent his gun to. Still, Allen refuses to budge. The prosecution's case rests heavily on these interviews and the bullet found near the scene. But here's the rub. If the bullet was planted, as the defense suggests, the implications are staggering. It's one thing to build a case based on circumstantial evidence. It's another to fabricate evidence to secure a conviction. The defense argues that Allen was already struggling with a psychotic break during the interviews, making his confessions unreliable at best and coerced at worst. On March 17, 2023, what Allen described as his come-to-Jesus moment, he began to confess to the murders. But was this a genuine admission of guilt or the ramblings of a man unraveling under pressure? And then there's Kathy Allen, Richard's wife, who was brought into the interrogation room in an attempt to break her husband's resolve. Kathy, by all accounts, was devastated her world shattered by the accusations against the man she had been married to for decades. When officers told her that Richard had killed the girls, her mind spiraled. She wondered aloud if she had missed any signs. Were there dirty clothes she hadn't noticed, boots covered in mud or blood? The psychological toll on Kathy is evident, and the strategy to use her to coax a confession from Richard is as ruthless as it is effective, just not in the way the officers hoped. The emotional manipulation doesn't stop there. Allen's confessions, if they can be called that, come in the form of fragmented statements made during phone calls with his wife and mother. I killed the girls, he says repeatedly, but the context is murky. Are these genuine admissions or the product of a man under duress saying what he thinks others want to hear? The defense insists it's the latter painting a picture of a man slowly unraveling in the isolation of his cell. The state, however, is confident in its narrative. They argue that the timing of Allen's confessions aligns too perfectly with his psychotic break to be mere coincidence. They believe they have the right man, and they're willing to stake their case on it. But as the trial nears its conclusion, one thing becomes clear. This is not just a trial of Richard Allen. It's a trial of the entire investigative process. How far is too far when it comes to securing justice? And when does the pursuit of truth become its own kind of crime? Holman's questioning, the inconsistencies in Allen's statements, and the possibility of planted evidence create a tangled web that the jury will have to untangle. The state's case in chief is nearly done, with just a few more witnesses scheduled to testify. But whether those witnesses will provide clarity or further muddy the waters remains to be seen. What we've learned so far raises more questions than answers, and as we move into the next phase of this case, those questions will only multiply. Stay with us as we continue to unpack the evidence, dissect the testimony, and search for the truth. Whatever that may be. The thing that sticks with me after watching hours of this case unfold is how the truth seems to drift further away the deeper we dig. You'd think by now, with the state presenting all their evidence, we'd have clarity. But instead, it feels like every answer we get raises five new questions. Richard Allen's demeanor during those interrogations? That's a psychological rabbit hole all its own. 
Is he a man with ice water in his veins or just someone too stubborn to let himself be railroaded by a system? He no longer trusts. What really hits hard is the use of the read technique. If you're not familiar with it, it's a method that can make even the most innocent person doubt their own memories. They bait. They offer a way out. They promise leniency without saying the exact words. It's the ultimate mind game. And Alan? He doesn't play along. His refusal to budge might just be the most unsettling part, because in cases like these, innocence and guilt aren't always the most obvious thing on display. It's about endurance. And Alan, whether innocent or guilty, has that in spades. Then there's the bullet. On the surface, it feels like the prosecution's ace in the hole. Physical evidence, a solid connection to Alan but the defense's counter, the possibility that it was planted, opens up a whole different can of worms. If there's even a sliver of truth to that, it's not just Alan's guilt or innocence that's on trial. It's the entire investigative process. Are we looking at a man brought down by his own actions? Or by a system so desperate for closure that it bent the rules to make the pieces fit? And the personal toll, it's staggering. Kathy Allen is living a nightmare of her own. Whether her husband is guilty or not, her life is shattered. She's ostracized, burdened with the weight of public judgment, and yet she stands by him. That kind of loyalty is rare, and it speaks volumes. But loyalty doesn't make someone innocent, does it? This case is about more than just what happened on those trails in Delphi. It's about how we as a society assign guilt, how we weigh the evidence, how we handle uncertainty, and how justice can become murky when emotions get involved. What will the jury do with all this? That's the real question. And frankly, I'm not sure anyone can predict the answer. Again, a big thank you to the reporting of Bob Mata and Defense Diaries, who's been in the courtroom every day of the trial. If you want to stay up to date on this case and others we cover, be sure to subscribe. In a world where the darkest secrets lie just beneath the surface. So they said it was an accident, but the evidence says otherwise. Where hidden killers roam unnoticed in the shadows. Well, I think you would definitely be looking at a, a blend of toxic, very bad narcissistic personality traits, and they will be vengeful and possibly resort to violence. Join Tony Bruschi as he uncovers the truth behind the most chilling cases. They said it was an accident, but the evidence clearly says otherwise. Each episode, we dig deep into the minds of those who commit the unthinkable. To your point on narcissism, he thinks in his own mind how witty he is, yeah. but he lost that jury. I, I was I was done with him in two minutes. From unsolved mysteries to infamous crimes. Geez, you've just talked about how you've taught yourself how to do everything under the sun. I bet you did a YouTube video, how to best kill somebody with a knife. Hidden Killers with Tony Bruschi takes you where few dare to go. How does someone with such a dark secret go unnoticed? for so long with multiple new episodes every single day we're not just telling stories we're seeking justice listen now on apple podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts just search for hidden killers with tony brewski